word today, I'm asking you to set some of our hearts free. Some of our hearts live in the captivity of fear. And God, I pray that today is the day that we quit living in captivity to the lie that fear is. God, we love you so much. Speak to our hearts, change us. And God, may the Dallas Cowboys destroy the Detroit Lions. And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen, amen in your face. I hate the Lions. Let's get to work. Let's get to work. Got a Lions fan on the front row trying to antagonize me. Let's go, everybody. <clears throat> Courage always seems like a luxury for the biggest person in the room. Courage always feels like that thing that as I read through scripture, some people have a little bit more than I do, but the reality is all of us, no matter how courageous you feel, will experience moments of profound fear in our lives. Now, if I'm just honest with you, I've never felt like a fearful person. I just haven't. I've never lived in the captivity of fear, but every once in a while you're reminded that no matter how strong and courageous you might feel, fear has this way of creeping into each and every one of our hearts. A couple weeks ago, I was having a great day. I was just killing it at work, enjoying my week. Things were going great. And then I got a message that my children's school was on lockdown. And we didn't know all the details, but all we knew was that there was an assailant on the property. We didn't know if they were carrying a gun. We didn't know if they had weapons. We didn't know anything. But my kid's school went into lockdown and my heart immediately also went into lockdown. It was crazy how in a moment my heart's posture could change from that of love and joy and peace to fear and anxiety and worry. Fear has this fascinating way of gripping our hearts. Now, I grew up in the kind of world where kids played until after dark, the kind of world where you wouldn't hear stories of there being shooters in schools. And thankfully for my kids, it wasn't that big of a deal. It wasn't a person actively trying to hurt people in the school, but it was scary for a moment. My kid's school went into lockdown. My son Gavin got in the car and we'd heard from his teacher that the kids had to kind of go into a private area for safety. And he held the hand of a little girl who was trembling in fear. He looked courageous, but he got in the car and teared up. And he said, I was so scared. Now I grew up in a world where that wasn't normal, but it's normal now. When I was a junior in high school, it made national and international news that there was a shooting at a school called Columbine High School. 15 people, including the shooters, died in this tragedy, and it changed the course of American history. For weeks, this was the leading story. For weeks, this was the story that rocked everyone's world. But now, now it's becoming normal. In 2019, in 46 weeks, there have been 44 shootings on school campuses, almost one for every single week. 15, 20 years ago, we were like, oh, I can't believe this is happening. And now our attitude is kind of like, well, there it is again. What can we do about it? Fear has this way, if we're not careful, of sneaking in and just devastating our souls. It has this way of robbing us of rest and of peace. A few weeks ago, my son Gavin he, he, I guess he heard in school about September 11th, and he didn't live through it. He didn't understand it. It was a, just a, a story in his history book, not a real moment in his life. And he started asking me questions about the terrible attack on our country. Almost 3,000 people died in that tragedy, but I think that maybe possibly even more devastating than the tragedy of those lives lost was the rippling effects of fear throughout our country. Fear has this way of causing us to look down at all of our circumstances and to look around for someone to help us. And then for some, it has this way of causing us to look upwards to maybe the only one who can even help. The Sunday after September 11th and those attacks, most churches in America were standing room only because people felt like in that moment fear had completely dissettled their world. And so they turned to the only one that they thought might be able to help. Well, why is fear such a dominating metaphor in so many of our lives. As you look through scripture, it's fascinating to me. You can find the phrase fear not or don't fear or don't worry 365 times. Some people say that the reason it's 365 times is so that every single day of your year, you can be reminded by God that you don't have to live in the stranglehold of fear. You just don't have to live in the prison of fear anymore. Now you need to know this, fear is an emotion. It's an indicator. It doesn't always mean that it's true, but it does mean that something is needing to be addressed in your life. But often what fear is, is nothing more than a liar. You need to know that fear is not of God. In fact, look what Paul says in the book of 2 Timothy. He says, God has not given us a spirit of fear. 
Fear is not from God, but here is what is from God, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That the picture that God has for your life is that you can live a life characterized by power, courage, strength, and love. Like how amazing would it be if we really understood what it meant to love everyone through the love of Christ. And then ultimately a sound mind, which means a mind that rests a mind that's not woken up in the middle of the night riddled with anxiety, the kind of mind that, that is living completely at peace, what would it look like if all of us were able to embrace this idea that fear is a liar and fear was never of God? So let's do whatever we can to just get rid of that fear. Let's do whatever we can. I want to admit something to you up front. It doesn't matter how good of a sermon this is. If we brought in the best speaker in the world, no person can help you eliminate fear in 30 minutes. It's just not possible. But I would love to give you some principles that you can use to help to deal with fear because all of us are going to experience it. Now to understand this, you need to know where does fear even come from? So I came up with this simple equation. A heightened sense of vulnerability plus a diminished sense of power is ultimately what equals fear and anxiety. To think about my situation with my kids for a moment. A heightened sense of vulnerability. I was 15 or 20 minutes away and there was nothing I could do. If I caught a helicopter to the school campus, I couldn't get on and help. There was nothing I could do. I was vulnerable and a diminished sense of power. It doesn't matter how much money I have in the bank. It doesn't matter what weapons I have on my body. It doesn't matter. There's, no, there's literally nothing I can do. I have no power in that situation. And that's what leads to fear and anxiety. So the question isn't, will you have fear in your life? The question that I want to wrestle with today is simply this. How do we respond? How do we respond when we experience fear? Because all of us, it's central to the human experience, is walking through days and seasons of fear. So how do we respond? Now, I've observed that there's about three different ways that people tend to respond to fear. So some people pretend that it's not there. They just close their eyes, they close their ears, and they act like it's not there. But then life has this way of shaking us, doesn't it? Life has this way of reminding us that it doesn't really matter how hard you try, doesn't matter what you do. Sometimes things happen. Sometimes you get the bad diagnosis. Sometimes you, someone gets in a car accident. Sometimes things just happen and it riddles your soul with fear. So what do you do with it? Some people pretend that it doesn't exist. Other people succumb to that fear. They live in anxiety. They live in worry. When my wife and I had our first couple of kids and they were really little, we decided to go visit some of her family. And so we made this long drive up to Charlotte, but because our kids were little, instead of driving through the day where they had the potential to scream in the car all the time. You've ever done that before? Any parent ever had a kid scream the whole time? You're like, at some point, if we don't give them water, they'll lose their voice. Have you ever had this moment, right? Right, you're like praying, Jesus, come back quickly. I don't even care at this point. Just come on back. Let's go, you know? You ever had that? So we decided to drive through the night. That's an important detail. We drove through the night in the dark time when it's unsafe, when people get sleepy behind the wheel, we drove through the night to get to see her family. We get up there and I get a couple hours of sleep. Remember, I drove through the night. So because I woke up on a couple hours of sleep, I had a headache and there was no medicine. So I thought to myself, well, there's a Walgreens like a block away from here, real close. I'm just gonna run to Walgreens and get some Tylenol or some Advil or something to get me through this little headache. So I say to her family, I was like, hey, I'm just gonna, just gonna run to the store real quick, I'll be right back. <laughs> her grandma says to me, okay, cool. Just let us know when you get there. Like it's, um, it's like right around the corner. I'll just be right back. Just, okay, cool, cool, cool. Just let us know. Just let us know that you're safe when you get there. I mean, I, I can't like basically see it from here. Like, what are you talking about? Just let us know. I'm like, I drove through the night. It's sunny outside. Now it's easier to drive now than when I drove through the night. I was like, why do you want me to call? And she goes to me, someone could have hit you over the head with a skillet. We don't know what's going to happen to you. So call us and let us know you're safe. I said, I'll tell you what, if someone hits me over the head with a skillet, I'll give you a call. How does that sound, right? Like some people just live under the weight of fear. They succumb to it. Others of us, we try to muscle through it. Like I've heard great leadership talks that say that often the dream in your heart is directly through your greatest fear. It's like you've got to plow through it like you'd plow through a wall as hard as you can with everything you've got. Just fight through your fear. And I, I believe that. And some of us, we try to muscle through our fear, but every once in a while, it doesn't matter how courageous we seem, fear has this way of leveling the playing field. And I just want to ask, how do we respond? Well, I'm going to offer you three thoughts. If you're a note taker, I want you to write these down. If you're not a note taker, go ahead and write these down. Number one, <laughs> we've got to stop trying to control what you can't control. 
You've got to stop trying to control what you can't control. Now, here's the reality about control. When we're feeling feared, what do we want to do? We want to try to take our hands and grip the steering wheel of our life as tight as we can, and we want to try to remain in control. But here's the reality about control. All of control is merely an illusion. It doesn't matter how much control you think you have. It doesn't matter how powerful you feel in a moment. Control is an illusion. If you haven't experienced that yet, write this down, because there will be in a day in your life when you feel like you're in control and you will be reminded quickly that it doesn't matter how much you work, doesn't matter how much money's in your bank account, doesn't matter how healthy you are, you are not ultimately in control of this life. Now look what David said. David, one of the most extraordinary humans to ever walk this planet, said this about God in Psalm 46. He said, God is our refuge and strength, which means he's where we run when we're in trouble and he gives us the power we need to get through this life. He's an ever-present help in trouble, which means he's always there when you're going through your darkest, most difficult days. He's there when you're waking up in the middle of the night completely just choking on the fear and anxiety that's, that's crippling your heart. He's always there. He's an ever-present help in time of trouble. Then verse 10, I love what he says. He says, he says, talking about God, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Now, this is what God invites us to do when we feel like our hearts are riddled with fear and anxiety. Look what he says. He says to be still. Now, this is hard for me because this feels passive. This feels like there's nothing I can do in this moment to fix the situation. This feels like there's nothing I can do. There's no amount of control that I can take. He just says to be still. Now, this phrase in Hebrew is an interesting phrase. If you were to translate it literally, it just means to cease striving. It means to stop trying harder. What we tend to do when we feel fear is we try to buck up as much as we can. We try to just roid up, get as strong as we can to fight the situation. But there's some situations where no amount of striving is ever going to fix the situation. So what do you do? You be still. Now, this, this phrase in Hebrew has this interesting word picture associated with it. Everybody do me a favor. Take both of your hands and lift them up like this at your side and hold it open. I want you to take it and I want you to lay it down at your side. I know you're sitting, but just lay it, both hands down at your side for just a moment. This phrase, be still, has this picture of taking your hands and putting them down at your side. Why is it? Think about all we do with our hands. We control things with our hands. We manipulate things with our hands. We move things with our hands. We feed ourselves with our hands. We push people away with our hands. We hold them close with our hands. Our hands are ultimately the tools that we tend to use to control the stuff around us. And the picture here that David gives us is this, is that we are to cease striving. We are to be still, which literally means we take our hands and we put them down, saying my hands are off of the steering wheel of my life. I'm letting go of control, God. I'm letting you be in control. It's not passive, it's active. God, I'm letting go so that you can take control. I'm letting go. It's not passive, it's active. I'm letting go, you be in control. So God says, be still. And then the second thing that he says is, and know that I am God. Now, what does this mean? It means you're not. No matter how much you want to be, no matter how much you would love to be in control and you would love to be the captain of the ship of your life, it doesn't matter. You are not God. He is God. So what happens when you begin to understand that he is God is that he is the one that can fix your situation. He's the one who can intervene. He's the one who can step in and do more in a moment than you can do in a lifetime of striving. So here, here's what it looks like for us. It means that we don't see striving because we know how it will all work out, but because we know the God who will work it out. That's what it means. We don't see striving because we know the end of the story. We just know that God is ultimately the one who's in control. So I could summarize it like this. Better than knowing the outcome is knowing God. Better than knowing how it's all going to shake out is knowing the one who's ultimately in control of all of it. So you got to start by letting go of control. Control is an illusion and fear is a liar. The second thing that all of us have to do is we have to look back when it comes to our fear. We have to look back. Now, this is funny because if you've ever read a leadership book, it's literally the opposite advice. Leadership books say oh, it's all about vision. It's all about the future. It's all about where we're going. Can I tell you the greatest indicator of success in the future? The success in your past. When we look back at God's faithfulness, it reminds us that he will be faithful in our future. 
Now, there's this fascinating story. We just read two verses in the book of Psalm 46. Those verses are referencing a story that happened some years later in the book, earlier in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Now, for the sake of time, let me tell you what's happening. In that season in Israel, Israel was divided into two countries, Israel to the north and Judah to the south. Each had its own king. The king in the south in Judah in 2 Chronicles 20 is a king named Jehoshaphat. Now, Israel and Judah had both gone through good kings and bad kings, but Jehoshaphat in Judah was a great king. He loved the Lord. He served the Lord. His people knew and loved the Lord. And because of this, Judah, the country, was blessed. And usually when people are blessed and when people are prospering, someone else gets jealous and they want to take it. And in that season, three different armies, one to the north, one to the south, and one to the east, all came to attack the people of Judah. They were three world powers. You can read about them in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Uh, they, were, they were the three ites. They were the, um, the Moabites, the uh, Ammonites, <laughs> some other ites, the termites. I don't know. There were three other ites. And they're all coming to attack the people of Judah. Now, in those days, because we didn't have GPS and video surveillance, you would have people that were spies set out miles and miles off in the distance to look to see if there's ever an army coming to attack. And one day, King Jehoshaphat, sitting in his kingdom, sitting on his throne, kinging it up like he did every single day. And all of a sudden, a man busts into his office out of breath, and he says, King, King uh, Jehoshaphat, King, 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 look, 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 look. Um, we're going to be attacked on three different sides by these three different ites. What do we do? Now, you ever read the Bible and you compare your life to their life? You ever read the Bible and you think like, man, they had so much courage. Look what it says about King Jehoshaphat. It says Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news and he begged the Lord for guidance. So he turns to his refuge. The only place that can even find help is in God. He's terrified in this moment, and he doesn't know what to do. Well, by this time, word is leaking to the country. Moms are hugging their daughters a little tighter before putting them to bed. They're kissing their boy's forehead just a little harder before they're setting him in bed for the night, not knowing if this will be the last night they ever get to go to bed alive. Dads are freaking out inside, trying to hold it together for their family, but they're wondering if this is the end of their story. The next morning, Jehoshaphat does something unique. He calls together the scribes, which were the historians of their day. And he says, I want you to read me the story of our history. Read me the story of our people. And the scribes pull the, the letters of history out and they begin to read the stories. And story after story after story is times that it felt like life was insurmountable, that the odds were stacked ever increasingly against their favor. God stepped in and intervened. And you could just feel this sense of hope beginning to rise among the people because God's faithfulness in the past always gives us faith and hope for our future. Hope begins to rise in the people. And all of a sudden, there's a sense that maybe the God that's been faithful in the past will continue to be faithful in this moment. The rest of the story is fascinating. The next day, they go out to fight, really feeling like they're facing their imminent death. Instead of leading with their best warriors, they lead with their worship team. So you got the electric guitars and the drummers. They're all out driving towards these people, thinking they're going to die. But when they get there, they're surprised to find that all three armies arrived in this valley at the same time and had turned on each other each other and all of them were dead and the people of Judah were spared. That God always intervenes for his people even when the odds seem completely stacked against him. So here's the principle from that story. We need to understand this, that we are to celebrate God's faithfulness in our past or we won't trust him with our future. At the end of the day, we need to look back at God's faithfulness in our past. Let me ask you this question. No matter what you've walked through in life, has God been faithful? If he's been faithful in your past, he will be faithful in your future so we can learn to trust him. But the third thing that we need to understand about fear is this, is that we're invited to pray about everything. We are invited to pray about everything. And if you're like me, you're like, well, of course, that's what you say. You're, you're a pastor. Pastors say to pray about everything. That's what we're supposed to do. Well, let me give you a different way to think about this, okay? Paul, one of the greatest people in the Bible, wrote like two-thirds of the New Testament. He finds himself in prison strapped to a Roman guard, knowing that any day he's going to be led out into the wilderness and he is going to lose his head. That's what's going to happen to him. He knows this is coming, okay? If you feel like you're walking through fear right now, try to compare it to that for just a moment, right? Any day he will be beheaded for his faith and trust in Jesus. And he writes this letter from this prison cell in Rome to this church in Philippi. We, we call it the book of Philippians, but it was a letter. And he writes this letter to them, and it's called the book of joy. Like, how do you have joy in those circumstances, right? And I want you to see what he says about what to do with fear and anxiety. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, don't worry about anything, which, 
Like, how do you say that when you're going to die any day now? Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. I'm going to come back to this phrase in just a moment. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. And then, verse 7 says, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. He uses this interesting phrase to pray about everything. Now, I've taught these verses like a thousand times. In these verses, there's this interesting key to prayer, which means you need to learn to pray at the level of your insecurity. Most of us tend to pray these superficial prayers, God help me, God meet this need, but we don't explain to God why. When we open our hearts and explain why, which is praying at the level of our insecurity, it opens our heart for God to step in and give us peace. But I want you to notice something earlier in the verse. He invites us to pray about everything. I don't know how you are when you pray, but often I get distracted when I pray. So I start by praying about big stuff. God, God, I'm praying for my friend who was just diagnosed with cancer. Please intervene. Please heal her. Please help her. Please step into that situation and be peace. I'm praying about big stuff, right? God, God there's crazy needs in our city. Help, help our church to rise up and meet those needs. I'm praying about big stuff. And then my mind wanders to pretty insignificant stuff, stuff that doesn't really matter. And I start praying about those things. And then I feel guilty about pray, praying about those things. Why is that? Then I'm like, stop, stop, stop. Okay, let's pray about something serious. So I start praying about something serious, and then my mind tends to wander away. I just want to teach you something unique about prayer. God is your heavenly father. I have three amazing kids. I care about everything in their life. I care about the candy they got at school. I care about the bully they're dealing with. I care about the teacher that's annoying them. I care about fantasy football scores. I care about everything in their life because they're my kids and I love them. In the same way, God cares about everything you experience in this life. He does. So you're invited to take everything to him. All of your fear, all of your worry, all of your anxiety, all the big needs in this world and all the little things that are just annoying you, take all of them to him. You'll, you'll start to realize that you're always in prayer. One of the books of the Bible, I believe it's James, teaches us to pray without ceasing. I literally think that what this means is that prayer should be a constant conversation between you and God because you're always sharing with him what you're walking through. You always are. Now, one of the things you'll learn as you pray, and especially as you bring fear to God, is he invites us to do something unique with it. You weren't intended to carry that forever. You, you will experience fear. Fear has this tendency of being a liar in our lives and you weren't intended to carry it. Look what the book of 1 Peter tells us to do. It says, cast all your anxiety on him. Cast all your anxiety on him. And here's the reason, because he cares for you. You're intended to not carry it anymore, but when it comes to the cares, the concerns of your heart, the fear that you're carrying through this life, you're invited to cast it, which means to throw it, to do whatever it takes to get rid of it, to get out from underneath it. If you've ever lifted weights before and you've had to bail on the weight because it was a little too heavy, you literally do. You push it off of you and you step back in the moment. You cast it off of you. You are invited by God to literally cast off or to get rid of all of the weight and anxiety and fear in your life, to cast it on him. Why? Because he cares for you. So we could summarize it by saying this, when it comes to fear, cast it. You weren't meant to carry it. Cast it, throw it off, get rid of it at all costs because you were never intended to carry it anymore. Look, I just know in a room of this size, some of you have carried fear for so long and it is devastating. It's been detrimental to your soul. And I just wanna say that today can be the day that you decide once and for all to let go. Today can be the day that you literally throw it, you cast it, you get rid of it. Look what Jesus says in the book of Matthew. Jesus himself said, come to me, all of you who are weary. You're exhausted, you're tired, because you're carrying a weight that you were never intended to carry. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Some of you find yourself every single night, waking up in a cold sweat because fear has a grip on your heart. You find yourself taking medication, and I'm not against medication if you need medication, but you find yourself doing anything you can do to try to get out under the weight of anxiety. And I just want to say to you once and for all, you can experience rest 
in your souls when you cast your cares upon him? What would it look like if all of us just made this decision that fear no longer has the final word in our life? That fear is a liar, fear is an emotion that we were never intended to carry. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be strong and courageous. All throughout scripture, you're reminded that fear no longer has the final word. So what would it look like if we started casting our fears so we can rest in his peace? Would you bow your head and close your eyes all across this room with me? Let me pray for you. God, give us the courage to stand up to our fears once and for all, to begin to realize that control is just an illusion, that fear is a liar, and that once and for all, fear has no hold on our hearts. God, give us the courage to stand up to the face of fear, realizing that fear no longer has to dictate our future. God, we celebrate your faithfulness in our life in the past, and we trust that it is an indicator of the future. You have always been good to us. You will always be good to us. You have always been there for us. You will always be there for us. You have always been a refuge in a place of strength. You will always be a refuge in a place of strength. So we lean in and we trust you, and we thank you for that, God. May we cast our cares upon you because you care for us. We thank you for it, God, in Jesus' name.